In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for the feast we have experienced this weekend. And I ask, Lord, that you would continue to open our hearts to all that you have for us to receive and then to begin to think how we will go back and share it with others. We thank you, Lord, that there is so much more water in the well for us to draw. And I, I pray you'd bless these remaining couple of hours we have before we disperse and go where you send us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Of all of the obstacles that littered my path on the way into the Catholic Church, no one and nothing was bigger than Mary. Initially, she represented the diversion, I thought, from true devotion to the Lord, to something that was made of plastic or stone. She was only the box that held the present, Jesus. And I didn't think that it honored the Lord to focus more on the wrappings than it did on him as the gift. And depending on which Catholic friend I spoke to, I heard qualities attributed to her that really seemed to only apply to divinity. Even titles like Queen of Heaven and Mother of God I struggled with. And I didn't understand how I could reconcile the love I, of Jesus that I knew I shared with my Catholic brothers and sisters with the antagonism that I felt toward Mary. As Scott began to share more and more of his appreciation of the Virgin Mother of God, I felt very challenged to at least, at least examine her role. Because for most non-Catholics, Mary is almost a non-person. I don't know if, if non-Catholics feel like they have to balance Catholics, and if Catholics say a lot about Mary, then non-Catholics will say nothing about her. But apart from a small mention at Christmas time, I don't recall any conversation ever about Mary, a book recommended, um, a hymn sung, conversations. I mean, really, she wasn't even put forward as um, a wonderful example of a disciple, really. And so there were prejudices, even if they weren't articulated, because she simply wasn't discussed. I think there had been a subconscious exclusion of Mary in my life of faith. Um, and I didn't, even, I didn't even acknowledge her really as someone to model my life after. Once I looked more closely at Mary, I could see what she had done that I wanted to do. Her response so quickly coming back to the angel saying, be it done according to me, be it done unto me according to your word, spoke to my heart because that's the heart response I wanted to give the Lord. And I began, and I mean began, it was small, but I began to have a little bit of appreciation for her. In fact, I, I prepared a talk. We were in, in Grove City. Neither of us were Catholic at the time, but I was to give a talk at Christmas time, and, and Scott challenged me, you know, make it a talk about Mary. And I'm like, well, I guess it's safe <laughs> if it's Christmas time. And so uh, I prepared a little bit of a thought, and I just had a caution in there about not, not ignoring someone who was so precious to Jesus. And I'm not kidding you, the two wives of the two pastors had already prepared um, singing a duet, and it was, um, oh, let's see, what was the hymn? Oh, I, I, what was it, what child is this? No, it yeah, I guess it is. What child is this? Sorry, it wasn't in my notes, but I, I, it comes to me as an illustration. And they had changed the closing words because the closing words are, the babe, the son of Mary, right? And they had changed it because they didn't want to give too much credit to her, and so they changed it to, the babe, the son of God. I mean, they had already planned that, and they sang that after my little talk, just saying, you know, in my talk, I'm saying, you know, let's not be allergic to, you know, at least looking at her as a model disciple. That can... <laughs> and here they changed the words of the hymn because they thought it gave her too much credit to say it was the son of Mary. Mary is so much more than a collection of dogmas and devotions. She is a person. She is not just the packaging of Jesus. She herself is a gift 
from the Lord. She is a holy and heroic mother who teaches us through her joys and sufferings. And what I want to do is walk through Mary's joys and sufferings just very, very briefly, almost like you know how Father Sean said yesterday that um, what we know about St. Anne and St. Joachim comes down to us because someone wanted, wanted Mary to know about her ancestors, wanted to know about her parents. And I want you to know your mother better. I want to know my mother better. So if you're not a Catholic, you may think that my talk is only for Catholics, but I want you to know Mary is your spiritual mother too. And you need to know what you have done, what she has done for you, so that her son is really appreciated as your savior and redeemer. And if you're a new Catholic, I hope this opens up some new understanding about Mary, because even becoming Catholic was tough, and, and Mary was still the hard part. Um, Ten days before I became Catholic, Scott said, you know, Kimberly, would you like to pray a rosary? And I said, I'm converting, don't push it. I will never be the model meek and mild. <laughs> so I want us to consider how scripture presents Mary's joys and sorrows. Her joys are unique as she became the mother of the Redeemer. I'm going to take this down because I feel like I'm looking through. Okay, I'm going to hold it. And her sorrows are referred to as Mary's martyrdom. Have you ever thought about that? Because the sufferings of the soul are even greater than the sufferings of the body. And she was of one heart, one mind with her son. It is a privilege to ponder alongside Mary the faith, hope, and love given to and required of our Blessed Mother. She is not a plastic saint, something we dust off. She is not just an observer, but she is an active participant on your journey of faith and mine. She is a living soul who welcomes us with open arms with a mother's embrace offered with the same love with which she embraced her precious son. And she's a compassionate mother who enters into the pain of another with a father's loving kindness. Joy number one, we first observe her at the Annunciation, Luke 1, 26 to 38. She responds to the joyous news that the Lord has chosen her to bear the longed-for Redeemer. Now, she was a woman of prayer. She would have prayed for the Redeemer. She may have even prayed for the mother of the Redeemer, knowing that the Redeemer would have difficult work to do. She had a heart for the world to know God. Without knowing everything that that would mean, she says yes. Be it done unto me according to your word. Her response is not, hey, you picked the perfect gal to do this. You know, I, I can do this. Let me raise the son of God. You know, she says, I'm available. I am the handmaid of the Lord. God has a plan for our lives as well. We may be tempted to respond in fear because there are so many unanswered questions and uncertainties, and yet, if we say yes, he will give us the faith and the strength and the grace to do his will. And Mary trusted that. Now, there's a sorrow right away. Because when she tells Joseph, he does not initially share her joy. Mary is alone at first. Now, the Lord does reveal the plan to Joseph in a dream. And he humbly responds as well. And by the time she leaves for the visitation, she knows that Joseph has her back, that they are united in this. Sometimes we have to bear good news alone. Sometimes as a couple, you might be the one who's thrilled to know there's a baby on the way, and that's not initially shared by your spouse. Sometimes a news of conversion, a new job, a move. Others may not share that joy at first, but we pray for others to share in our joy and the Lord gives you strength in the wait. The next joy, without hesitation, Mary makes plans to visit Elizabeth. She is so eager to take the Savior to someone. She wants to share the good news with someone who understands. She glorifies the Lord in the Magnificat, proclaimed after Elizabeth's greeting to her. And she says, future generations will call me blessed. 
And we are one of those future generations calling her blessed. And then she has another sorrow. After three months, she returns home to await the birth of the baby, but a census interrupts the plans. She isn't going to be able to give birth in her hometown, surrounded by her mother and all the women in the village. She's going to have to ride a donkey. Okay, ladies, in your ninth month of pregnancy, does that sound like happy news? <laughs> okay, let's, let's saddle up old, old Bessie and <laughs> take a 70-mile hike up to, uh, to Bethlehem. But the census is called. They have to uproot. I even think of Joseph. I mean, here he is, a carpenter. Like, of all the things you would want to make, can you imagine making the cradle for your firstborn son? And Joseph had to even die to that. They have to pack up what little they can carry, and they go to Bethlehem, and they arrive. You know all the details. There are so many unknowns. And she delivers in a stable, in a little cave meant for animals, and she places her newborn son in a trough. Things are not always the way we expect them to be. But again, they show us we can trust the Lord. Okay? And so she has the joy, even in the midst of that sorrow, she has a joy of giving birth to her son. Now, to be honest, she gets to do something that all of us, when we deliver our first children, or any of our children, are very drawn to do. We are so taken with them. We practically adore them, but she got away with it. <laughs> she had the consolation of holding in her arms her very own son. And the shepherds, they bring this unbelievable news of the angels appearing and declaring that the Christ has been born, the Savior. And Mary kept all of these things, pondering them in her heart. Do you take time to ponder the amazing things that God has done in your life. As we just heard, you know, Ian give his testimony. He has taken time to ponder how God has been at work. Do you do that? Because God has been at work in your life as well. And that brings us to the next joy of the presentation in the temple. Mary and Joseph are so poor that they bring pigeons as the purification offering. And that's what the poorest people brought they obey the law. They obey the law. And they come. They bring the Lord of lords and the king of kings, the Lord of the temple, into his own temple. And yet, most people don't know who's just entered the building. But Simeon knows. He is full of the Holy Spirit, and he takes Jesus in his arms, and he proclaims, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to thy people Israel. Mary and Joseph's response is they marveled. They marveled. What is God orchestrating here? It's incredible. And yet the sorrow comes immediately because Simeon continues to speak. He blesses them both, it says, and Simeon blessed them, and then he turns to Mary specifically. Behold, this child is set for the fallen rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. Now, every pregnancy includes how many hopes and dreams for that child. And Simeon's prophecy includes promises of incredible things that will happen, but also terrible things that lie ahead. Mary is going to need great courage to face the fact that Jesus' life will be threatened. It's like getting horrific news, but not having any idea of the timing of that. She relinquishes her right to have joy without sorrow. She loves her son, and if he suffers, she will suffer. She still consents to the will of God, just as she did at the Annunciation. She probably had similar questions as she did with the Annunciation. When will this happen? Where will this happen? But Simeon doesn't give her any details. Okay? She just has to trust. And again, her heart cry is, your will be done. She isn't trying to bargain her way out of the sorrow. Waves of concern can capsize a boat of faith. But Mary chooses to trust the Lord, to keep her focus on 
him rather than the concerns, and she faces the uncertain future without fear. She does not know what will cause such heartache in the future, but she resolves to trust the one who knows the future, her heavenly Father. Suffering is inevitable in every one of our lives. We cannot control the circumstances, but we can choose how we respond. The news of impending difficulty changes things, even before that actual calamity occurs, when we get terrible news from a doctor, a report from the lab technician. Maybe a family member shares something secret that we didn't know. But it can give us perspective on life and deepen our gratitude depending on what our response is. We can still live each day intentionally even though we know something ominous will occur. The prophecy is for her alone. And that means that Joseph won't be there. I don't know if you've thought about there that, but there is no father that would not be at the death of his son if there, if there was any way he could be there. And so most likely, she's already being told that she will be widowed before this horrible thing happens. And it's interesting that Anna comes up to them immediately after. Anna was someone who had been widowed at a young age. And Anna is a messenger of hope and courage for Mary. Next, we have another joy, and that's the visit of the Magi. Mary and Jesus received that breathtaking witness of the Magi who have traveled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. And they come in, and they kneel before Mary the mother and Jesus. They adore, they worship Jesus. These are foreigners. These are not Jewish people. And yet they lay at his feet gifts fit for a king, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. But almost immediately after, we have the next sorrow, which is that flight into Egypt. No sooner had the Magi left than Joseph is warned in a dream that Jesus' life is in grave danger from King Herod. The Holy Spirit reveals the plan to Joseph, and he's urgent. He has to obey immediately. And so as the angel comes to Joseph and says, rise, you've got to go, he immediately goes to Mary and he says, get up, we have to get ready, we must go immediately. Mary doesn't even question his leadership. She trusts the Lord and she trusts her husband. Mary relinquishes her right to raise her son where she wants to, near family. Now they're going to be exiles in Egypt. They are aware of the prophecy, undoubtedly, of Rachel weeping for her children. And I think of this because I think part of what Mary bore was an understanding that as she was rescuing her son, she was not able to warn the other parents that their children would die. Other parents will soon mourn their children while they escape with Jesus. Mary cannot save these little babies who we refer to as proto-martyrs. They die for our Lord or their bereft parents from pain. They suffer displacement, fleeing the threat of harm. They would have felt vulnerable and lonely, and they didn't know how long they would be exiled. They leave everything behind, including whatever new business Joseph had drummed up as a carpenter possessions, everything that was familiar to go to a land that was pagan, where they didn't speak their language. No time for goodbyes. They flee to Egypt, most likely to a Jewish community there, but it would have been a long trek. And the things that Jesus would experience of cold and tiredness and probably hunger in some ways, certainly Mary and Joseph experienced and yet they knew the scriptures, and they would have reviewed the Psalms. The Lord is our refuge, our stronghold, our fortress, our deliverer, our shelter in the storm. We may need to leave what is familiar to us in obedience to the Lord, especially in the area of coming into the Catholic Church. I don't really understand the will of God. We meet so many people who our books or tapes seem to to do the thing of drawing them in and making something clear. And in all of our, 
accumulated years, over 28 years of being Catholic, one cousin's son has converted. No other family members at this point. And I just ache to share this with them. And yet that's not been God's will at this point. So through conversion, God may call you to a spiritual separation from your family, unfamiliar with the liturgical life of the church, and yet trusting God to lead you into, into that place where he is prepared for you in the hopes that maybe you will rejoin your family there. The next joy is finding Jesus in the temple. Now, this is one of the joyful mysteries of the rosary. I'm sure you've thought a lot about it. And the obvious thing is, why are they joyful? Because they discover Jesus after three days. But this is also a sorrowful mystery. Imagine that. They faithfully take Jesus on the 70-mile journey with them for this huge celebration for Passover. And Jesus is now a son of the law. So it's a new experience, even though they've been there before. He enjoys their trust. He's free to mingle. They assume he's with the group leaving, but Jesus chooses not to leave. Is it an act of rebellion or willfulness? Well, we know Jesus isn't sinful, so no, but it does counter their wish. They are not aware that he has made a decision. They travel an entire day with the group before they realize he's not there. They return to Jerusalem on the second day, and they still search until they find him. Try to imagine the frustration, the confusion, the concern, the anger. Did they even stop to sleep? Could you sleep if you knew that your child was missing? How did they have food? Where did they go? And they come, and they find him in the midst of this group where he seems to be teaching. He's answering questions. It's not easy for a parent to differentiate between true and false guilt when a child is lost in some way. The if-onlys and the what-ifs can completely derail us. And there's an additional challenge not to turn on your spouse and sort of play the blame game. Weren't you paying attention? Weren't you watching? Why wasn't he with you? By the grace of God, we could be better parents, but still, our children have to be placed in God's hands because we can't be there all the time. So they find him, and he is serene. He's calm. I mean, have you ever asked yourself, what did he do at night? Where did he sleep? How did he eat anything? Maybe he just was in the temple morning, noon, night, middle of the night, and never left. And his response is astounding. As a parent, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? Not like, couldn't you have guessed I was here? It was like, it's a rebuke. It's like, you should have known this is where I would be. And the temple is the personal place for him. He is first and foremost God's son. He is very aware of who he is and what his mission is. Jesus knew the will of God, and he was doing it. Now, this is a confidence our children don't have and we don't have. We're still floundering, but Jesus had no doubt the critical thing is, to be a good parent, you don't have to be omniscient. Mary and Joseph don't know this, but they still have to trust the Lord. Had they failed to protect Jesus? No, but he no longer needed their help in the same way. He is a son of the law. He is considered a man in the Jewish community, and he chose not to ask permission. They're relieved and his response doesn't evoke a further rebuke. He does go home with them immediately and resumes being the obedient son at home. But even though Mary will have more years with Jesus, she already can see in the distance the separation occurring. Part of our suffering as parents is that we have such limited knowledge and wisdom. And it seems like the, as soon as we get the hang of parenting, we have to stern, start to learn how to de-parent how to back, take a step back, how to give God room to just call our children specifically, individually, and to let go of them in that sense. We have to keep reminding ourselves that our children belong first and foremost to the Lord. 
we have to relinquish our right to direct their lives. And I think here is an interesting thought that Mary had to let go of her right, so to speak, to have Jesus obey her desires. He was obedient, but he didn't have to do everything she wanted him to do if he had a clear sense that it was something else God wanted him to do. So she accepts the mystery of God's actions on her son. And now we hit more sorrowful mysteries in a row before we get to the final joyful ones. The next sorrow, and this is after years of living together in, in holy communion in that home, I cannot imagine, and seeing Joseph most likely through his death and then Jesus' ministry. The next mystery that we ponder is, G is Mary meeting up with Jesus on the way of the cross. Mary is present during Jesus' suffering leading up to the crucifixion. She has too much courage and compassion not to be. I personally think that even her separation from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was one of her sorrows. Because if she could have been there with him, she would have. And I think at that point, as Jesus withdraws the angels from Jesus and the disciples are not supportive, that, that he is, it's part of his drinking that cup of suffering that Mary is not present but is somewhere, I am most certain, praying for him. She had to extend forgiveness while they harmed her son. She understood his mission, and she was of one heart with him. I think part of why thinking about her involvement at the foot of the cross is so important to me is that it seems to me it is so easy for us to not think of Mary as a person. Because she's sinless, we don't think of her sorrowing. We don't think of her as a human being, a human mother going through that. And, uh, and, and at least for me, this brings it into sharper focus. She bears him while he bears the cross. She knows he is voluntarily, voluntarily laying down his life to redeem his people, even though it appears that others are forcing him to die. But she knows this is his choice. She is not unclear about his mission. She is powerless to alleviate his sufferings. And I would say even further, his knowledge that she is there increases his suffering as his increases hers, and yet there is a way in which they also are of such one heart that they also bear each other's sufferings at the same time because they know what the point is. It's essential to save you, to save me, and to redeem the world. It is worth it. But she knows the powerlessness that a parent feels when a child is in pain, severe pain, especially when it is suffered unjustly. She trusts her heavenly father, giving him the gift of her suffering united to Jesus. She chooses to forgive. And she does not lash back out. She doesn't turn on the disciples who flee or those who are inflicting this pain. Other women are, at the pre are present with her at the foot of the cross. And they share her sorrow. They have their own sorrow. And yet, and yet, there is something that only she experiences as the mother. Typically, our response to pain and frustration is sadness, and we turn inward to console ourselves, especially when the cause is unjust. Mary's sorrow is real, but this is interesting. She doesn't turn in. She is not Our Lady of Sadness. She's Our Lady of Sorrows, because it is, in fact, a sorrow, but the focus is outward. The catechism actually teaches us she never lost the virtue of joy in the midst of this sorrow. And so she stands vigil by the cross. And it's interesting, the, the, the passage from John 19, 25 says she was standing. Now, I don't know how she could stand, but it was to give whatever strength, I think, to her son that she could while she could. And so she stands at the foot of the cross until he dies. She can't 
take away his suffering, and she wouldn't because she knew the purpose, but she can share it. This is courageous love demonstrated through her presence. She hears him say, I thirst, and she knows it's not just talking about physical thirst, that it's that thirsting for souls, and she shares it. He thinks of her from the cross, and it is from the cross that he gives her as a gift to the beloved disciple. And brothers and sisters, we are that beloved disciple to whom Jesus gifts his mother. If we are beloved disciples, she has been given to us. And it's with great difficulty, so he only says the things that are most essential. And yet he gives her to the beloved disciple and then gives him as a son to her. And so we are a gift to Mary. We are her beloved daughters and sons given from the cross by Jesus. Mary knows the excruciating pain of watching a loved one suffer and die. She alone is, she is alone in her understanding. I mean, even those who grieve at the foot of the cross with her do not comprehend what is actually occurring. As the first disciple, Mary is willing to conform herself to Christ. And like Mary, no one escapes the embrace of the cross without being pierced. Jesus' example shows Mary how to forgive all of us, especially for our ingratitude, not only for what Jesus has done, but our ingratitude toward Mary, what she did on our behalf for our salvation. And Mary relinquishes her right to die before her child. There's something so wrong about burying a child. And yet Mary relinquishes her quote-unquote right to die first. Instead of lashing out at us for causing his suffering and death, one of her titles is Refuge of Sinners. She invites us to draw close to her. She welcomes us at her side as, as children of the Father. She's the compassionate mother who calls us to repentance. This is what my son did for you. Get to confession. <laughs> get, get, to take a, get this salvation applied in your life, you know. Because she wants us to receive the grace that we can from what her son suffered. And then Mary receives back what she has given, which is the body of Jesus. These are the arms that hugged her, the hands that she held, the cheeks and lips that she kissed. The body is not just a shell. It's so much more than a container of the spirit. And I think how heavy his body would have been. But she needed to cradle him one more time. She needed to rock him in her lap one more time. She sees his wounds up so close. I, I imagine she would have wiped his brow. She might have helped take the nails out or the, or the, the thorns out, not the nails. She knows that the greatest sufferings were not even in that body but in his soul. And would she have wept? One of the movies has, has, I think it's Jesus of Nazareth, where the mother just weeps. And I had a friend say to me, oh, that's so unpious. I can't believe they have Mary groveling like, I said, like a mother? <laughs> she was a Jew. Come on. <laughs> they mourn. They, they wail. She didn't cry as a thing no faith but it was still her son. I guarantee you she wept. The virtue of compassion is pity combined with piety. Jesus himself wept at the death of Lazarus, and he knew he was going to raise him. <laughs> and then time's going. The Sabbath's coming. I cannot imagine this. How did she let go? How did
would she just let them bury him right away? I would want to hold my son as long as I could. But she relinquishes her right to hold him as long as she could. She has sorrow without bitterness. I cannot fathom that. Sometimes she's called mother of solitude. And some suffering she carries alone. I, it was interesting. Father Cesario has a beautiful booklet reflecting on the sorrows of Mary. And he says this. It's a particularly important to priests who can, be a comfort, who can be comforted when they're most alone. It says, quote, God has predestined Mary and priests to handle, albeit diversely, that is physically or sacramentally, the body of Christ. And so she is mother of solitude as well as mother of sorrows. She did not cling to him, and so she does not cling to him now. A part of him would always be with her, and a part of her had died. When you lose a child, you know a part of you has died. It's relentless how time marches on, but it does. She also relinquishes her right to bury him where she might choose, or even to prepare the body for burial alone. God provides. Joseph of Arimathea steps forward, and he will place Joseph's, jo, sorry, Jesus' body in a newly hewn tomb. And a speaker said recently, it's interesting, it's like a virginal tomb, just as Mary was a virginal womb. And he is placed in this tomb. Nicodemus has 100 pounds of spices to put on the body. At birth, Mary had wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. But now others administer the spices and wrap him in the linen shroud. And she does whatever she can, treating his body with love and respect. And then the stone is rolled into place. And Mary had to walk away. These sorrows aren't only thrust on Mary, but she chooses to embrace them. I don't know what sorrows you may be facing at this moment. But I believe Mary wants to be a model for you in embracing those sufferings and offering those sufferings back to the Father. There is so much to ponder in silence and in sorrow. Mary's faith did not keep her from suffering, but it enables her not to be bitter or hard-hearted. Her grief was real, but so was the faith, hope, love, and even joy real. She is bereft, but not without hope. Now, have you ever asked yourselves, why isn't Mary at the tomb when the stone is rolled away? Because she knew he wasn't there. Jesus predicted several times that he would die, and in three days he would rise. And I believe Mary believed him. I believe that she knew he was not going to be in that tomb. And that's the fullest fulfillment of Elizabeth's expression of greeting. Blessed is she who believed. She still had to walk in faith. She still had to wait for the three days. But I believe Jesus appeared to her and probably appeared to her first. Many scholars believe this. She's an instrument of grace to all who abandoned Jesus as he went to the cross. And as great as her grief was, I believe her joy was even greater. Now, she had to walk through forgiving, forgiving the disciples who abandoned him and meeting with them being a part of Jesus' appearances with them, and there's, there's nothing she holds back in terms of love and being that channel of grace to those disciples. She's in the upper room at Pentecost when they receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. She is the first and best disciple of Jesus, showing how we are to love Jesus to the end. And she extends her spiritual motherhood beyond the beloved disciple to every one of us as beloved disciples. 
And finally, and we don't know the timing of it, but he preserves her by assuming her into heaven bodily and crowning her. He is the king of kings. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Mary is his mother, the queen mother of the, of the son of David. Why does Mary sorrow? Because she loves deeply. We, we've really got to be careful that we don't assume that Mary had it easy because she knew Jesus was saving everybody. She was still a real human person who had to walk through that. But what is an increase to her sorrow? Our ingratitude. The way we so easily say the creed, say we believe all these things, and yet walk out the door and live our lives as if we are the Lord and Master of our lives. Not submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. We need to ask her to help us to understand how to appreciate what Jesus has done for us. What, in fact, she has done for us. We have a Savior because she said yes. Mary is the star to light the path, our spiritual journey. One author said this, quote, To walk with and to imitate Mary in our whole lives is to open our hearts to receive God's love in the midst of our sorrows, to listen to God's word, and to act on it so as to cooperate with God for the healing and salvation of the world. One of the incredible things is we are part of the body of Christ. And according to St. Paul in Colossians 1.24, we can offer our sufferings in union with his to make up for what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. Now, does that mean Christ's offering is inadequate? No. But he allows us to so be a part of his body that we can participate in the salvation of the world as our sufferings are united with his. So don't waste your suffering. Don't waste your suffering. On the other hand, if you're not suffering at the moment, I'm going to caution you. It's a lull. <laughs> okay? <laughs> the really tough thing is, in this world, we will have tribulation. So if you're in a lull, learn everything you can <laughs> to fortify yourself so that you can have that holy and heroic response when the suffering comes. We can join our sufferings to Mary's as she joined her sufferings with her sons to participate in the work of redemption. This is glorious. This is beautiful. We need to get to know our spiritual mother. And we need to love her. We need to really love her. I want to tell you something, an, a little illustration. I had a difficult time relating to Mary when I first became Catholic. I just grew up, I shared this the other day in, at ABS, but I'm going to share it again. I, I, I heard Jesus' name, I'm sure, every day of my life. And so I never questioned whether or not Jesus existed, and I, I loved him, and you know everything my parents told me I believed. But Mary, as I said, was a non-person, really. Uh, so I didn't know how to relate to her. And I kept praying for a way to emotionally connect to her. And people would say, oh, I love her so much. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I cannot relate to this. And a, a woman, a college student who was over for a Bible study, happened to mention that every time she found a penny, her mother would hand it to her and say, never forget mommy loves you. And I thought, I'm going to use that. I am going to use that because, you know, when you hear coins drop, even if it's only a penny, it catches your attention. And I thought, okay, every time I find a penny, I am going to thank God for Mary's love for me. And then I'm going to thank her personally for her love for me. And then I will find a child and hand them the penny and say, never forget, Mommy loves you and Mother Mary loves you. And I'll just start planting that seed in my heart, in their heart. There have been so many experiences of discovering a penny. We have walked into perfectly clean hotel rooms and a penny's on the floor or on the desk. We have found pennies on walks in the neighborhood. We have found, um, I, I took, one of our children had to go to Cleveland Clinic for a, a number of special tests and was, it was a scary experience and I had, to I had to take my son alone 
so we got to a hotel at night, and in the morning we came out to go over to the Cleveland Clinic, and under the ice by my door were two pennies embedded in the ice. I couldn't even pick them up, but they were right there, you know, just for me. And um, we went to Miami one time. We were walking around, and um, I, I kept saying, we, we had an unusual amount of time to walk, and I kept looking for pennies. And I'm like, I know Mary's praying for me, but I just keep thinking that she's going to send me a penny to remind me of that. And it didn't happen. And it's funny because in the airport we talked about it, and, and I said, you know, I... Because I've been looking for pennies, I've been thinking of her thinking of me and praying for me. So it's kind of had the same re, uh, result. And um, so we went through the, the, the uh, security line, and this woman in front of me said, oh, here's a penny. And she turned around and she said, here you go. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and my husband turned to her and said, you have no idea what this means. <laughs> And she said, oh, here's another one. And she handed me another one. I'm like, oh, my gosh. My husband says, if you find a quarter, the father loves you. I don't know. <laughs> when we take walks in the neighborhood with, and I have a couple good friends that we, years ago, we used to do this on one walk. We almost always found a penny on our walks. But in one walk, we found seven pennies. I mean, we, our hearts were so full, and we each had two or three to take back to give to our children. I have um, a thing when my kids pack up for college, I take one of those rolls of 50 pennies, I just scatter them all throughout their stuff, and you know, never know when it's going to fall out. I, one of my kids uh, found a penny in a parking lot, and he said, Mom, all I could think was, my mother loves me, my mother loves me, my mother loves me. <laughs> I wish I had thought to bring a penny for every one of you. Um, and I don't know who was the precious angel who did this, but we literally walked in and someone had left two pennies on chairs over here. And I thank you. I thank you. But I want you to know you are on Mary's heart. She is your spiritual mother. And she longs to draw you to herself and to say, I want you to know my son better. It never stops with her. She is always pointing beyond herself to her precious son. But she is not just the wrapping of the gift. She is a gift too. A gift you are to receive. A gift for whom you need to give God thanks every day. A disciple worthy of imitation to follow, to love, to treasure, to share. Don't be embarrassed to talk about your mother, okay? Let's close in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most gracious Lord, I thank you for the gift of Mary. I ask that you'd help us to find the words to share about her with our non-Catholic family and friends because she isn't just the spiritual mother of Catholics. She's the spiritual mother of every Christian I pray that you will help us to make up for the ways in which she is denigrated and dishonored for the unkind things said about her from a zealous spirit that does not understand the gift that she is. And I pray that we would not ignore her, that we wouldn't reduce her simply to a mere statue or painting, but that we would know the person that she is and the gift that she is, and we would receive her into our home of our heart. Please help us to know her and love her because we know and love you, Jesus. And Mary, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.